All right, so we talked about some of the continental shelf um, communities and the intertidal zone. And now we're going to move further out into the ocean and talk about life near the surface. So now, again, this can be over the continental shelf, but it can also be over the abyssal plain where there's a lot more depth and a lot less substrate. Okay, but we're, so we're going to start by what we call uh, over uh, the top part of the ocean, the epipelagic zone. Now, if you're over the shelf, it's called the neuritic. If you're over the plain, it's called the oceanic waters. But we're talking about the area that's about 200 meters to the to the top to the surface of the ocean uh, the general term for this water column that's not uh, benthic or close to the substrate is pelagic so often you'll hear um, organisms referred to as pelagic such as the shark that we just saw because it just swims around in the ocean ocean it doesn't really interact with the benthos or the ocean floor. Uh, life near the surface is characterized by being the warmest part of the ocean because, of course, it is exposed to sunlight. It also has the most carbon dioxide because the carbon dioxide in the ocean comes from the atmosphere. And so it's the closest to the atmosphere and thus receives uh, that carbon dioxide as, as it diffuses in there. It's the warmest, has the most light, therefore these are all the conditions for photosynthesis. And so it has the most primary production and supports um, pelagic organisms and other communities through currents. So going deeper into the ocean or over different parts of the ocean, all of everything that goes on there um, can be carried around. Again, there's no substrate because there's nothing to cling to. There's also not a lot to hide from. And so you have a lot of predators, um, including dolphins and tuna and sharks and things like that. So one thing we're going to clearly define for you guys is the term plankton. I know you guys have heard of it, and sometimes uh, perhaps in SpongeBob you have this guy whose name is plankton, but plankton is actually not referring to any type of organism. Instead, it's just organisms that have to float around because they cannot self-propel themselves at least not very much so they are at the mercy of their currents and these thrive in this upper level upper 200 meters of the epipelagic many of them are microscopic however there are uh, lots of different ways that we can look at them we can look at them by their size by their trophic level or the length of time is spent in the as plankton let's talk about some of these different planktons then if we're going to divide them up by size, we can just simply create um, measurements and then organize them accordingly. So we don't really talk too much about femtoplankton. This is really, really small um, things which are floating around. But we will generally start to talk about organisms as picoplankton. So this is the cyanobacteria, the really small things that can photosynthesize, and the other bacteria and things that eat them. Uh, the nanoplankton from 2 to 20 micrometers, still very microscopic, generally protists. And then the mycoplankton and the mesoplankton are starting to get into this um, visible range of these really small things, but you can still see, see them. Mactoplankton, then 2 to 20 centimeters, so these are things you could pick up and touch and feel. And then megaplankton, these are big things like seaweed and jellyfish, right? So you don't think of jellyfish as plankton, but they don't have any way to like directionally go in any certain way. And so they really are just at the mercy of the current, and sometimes they'll wash up on shore, and that's where we will usually see them. But they'll float around and, uh, and try and capture other types of plankton in their life cycle. All right, now we can also look at how often they are plankton. So some organisms are only plankton for a small part of their life, such as this fish larva. So we would call them <coughs> meroplankton. But if you're plankton your whole life, which a lot of those smaller plankton types are, then you would be called holoplankton. And so most of these things here are holoplankton. Uh, the fish larva with the, being the one exception as meroplankton. All right, the trophic status. So generally when we look at 
trophic levels, we start with phytoplankton, plankton that are photosynthesizing or generating their own energy through uh, photosynthesis. Um, and these include diatoms, dinoflagellates, cyanobacteria, coccolithophores, silicoflagellates. So all of these are um, labeled. So on the top right is diatoms. You've got dinoflagellates. Top left, um, silicoflagellates, silico bottom right, and then uh, cyanobacteria, right middle, and coccolithophores, bottom left. All right, so those are phytoplankton. Zooplankton are then plankton that eat the the, the phytoplankton, or they might also eat other zooplankton. Okay, so they're slightly, slightly larger and are the next trophic scale up. Um, these, this is just a figure from your book, the major groups of marine plankton. Um, you can organize them this way. So net plankton include those, some of those things we both talked about. Um, and then you have nanoplankton and pegoplankton. Those are the two different sizes, which were also on that graph. And uh, we won't go through this too much. We already talked about some of those other ones. But um, mostly, the, the, the smaller they are, the more important they are in photosynthesis. And thus create that bottom trophic level for other organisms to feed off of. All right, the zooplankton can have uh, again larger slides. Sometimes we there are there are small crustaceans which are referred to as copepods, which are about seventy percent of the zooplankton. And what's interesting is there are enough copepods in the ocean to make some of the largest organisms in the world, those being whales. So. Uh, the blue whale, which is the largest animal in the world, uh, feeds on lots of different types of things, but a, a big proportion of its diet are krill, which are mostly these copepods. All right, there are other types, salps, which is, uh, there's a figure there from book on the top right, and larvations, which are bottom right. These are pelagic tunicates. Tunicate is a phylum of animal. We'll talk about them later. And they utilize mucus nets to capture food particles. And you can see there's a colonial picture of them to the left, um, where they're all creating this large mucus net together. But they can also do this um, by themselves in solitary, as solitary organisms. The pteropods are also planktonic. These are very interesting because they are mollusks. So mollusks you um, are probably more aware of the shelled types that have like clams or octopi or even snails, these are this in the same group. They just have modifications. Um, for example, you see these two little parts that are found in all the mollusks, is, which is called the foot. <clears throat> and it has separated and created little wings that it uses to swim through uh, the ocean. These can be found in both the upper or lower parts of the water column. And they eat phytoplankton and other zooplankton. All right, here are some larger ones. You have arrowworms at the bottom left here, predators of smaller plankton, and then jellyfish, jellies, comb jellies. Um, like I said before, are larger organisms, and some can be very large. You can see in the bottom right there. I'm not actually sure if that's real, but because um, it's just a meme, but maybe. We should check that out, fact check it. Um, but they can get become very long and large and uh, float around in the ocean. On the other hand, we have nectin. Nectin are animals that can go wherever they want. They have the, they're large enough and have enough energy and muscle mass to move around to the areas where they need to feed. Um, so these are kind of like the teenagers of the sea, whereas the plankton were more like the younger kids who kind of had to listen to their parents all the time, right? Well, the nectin are, you know, they get up and every morning and say, you can't tell me what to do, where to go, and I'm going to go to my friend's house if I want to, like the little crush the turtle there and this cuttlefish. Okay, so lots of things, the things that you see moving around, fish and such, these are more generally referred to as nectin. 
All right, so now let's look at the conditions of the epipelagic zone. Some of the uh, modifications for this environment allow organisms to float, right? Because they, there is no substrate for them to cling onto, so uh, they're clinging, more or less, onto the surface. And so they may have air bubbles that they've trapped into certain structures, or fish have swim bladders that they use to uh, increase or decrease their buoyancy, uh, lipids, which are, are going to be repelled and generally lighter than water, will help them float. And sharks have livers full of lipids. And they may just increase surface area, such as jellyfish have this large mantle, and they kind of push it around. But you can see all these uh, little ones on the bottom right here. They have these large appendages, which help to increase their surface area, and they can float and move through the water in that way. Some of the floaters uh, are called neustin, where they float just beneath the surface, so you can't really see them at the surface, or plustin, where some of the animal is above the water and has this little float. So you can see an example of this on the top right. This is called a Portuguese man of war. war. Sometimes called the, people think it's a jellyfish, but it's actually not, uh, but it's similar to a jellyfish. And then you have janthia and villella. These Jantia are, but you've perhaps seen these before. I've seen these on the uh, on the shore at the beach sometimes. But they have these little floats on the top and it kind of also acts like a sail, sail where they can kind of push through the water using that. All right, a very important part of the open ocean is that you have lots of predators. There's no place to hide. And so the food chain is always actively being um, used and the top predators are abundant and they also have to have lots of adaptations to make sure that they're good predators because right? there's lots of competition as well so the fastest swimming organisms in the ocean are found in this depth including this sailfish which is the fastest fish in the sea and it can go up to 60 miles an hour in the ocean so if you think of a cheetah running about 60 miles an hour with little resistance in the air this is an amazing feat that this fish can do because it's it's going through a much thicker substance which is the water however it does use that thicker water to push against it but anyway there's lots of drag and things and we'll talk about of them in a minute. There's also coloration um, and behaviors to help organisms uh, be camouflaged and uh, reduce their probability of being eaten. Um, migration, so not, there are migrations, of course, from one area to another, but also up and down the water column. So some fish will go up and down. And then there are other modifications like eyes, um, large eyes and sense organs, including a lateral line, which is found in most fish, where they can feel um, movement in the water. And that can help them direct their attention towards certain prey. All right, so again, I mentioned eyes. Um, many predators have very large eyes that they use. The lateral line senses the vice those vibrations and movements in the water. And another very specialized one found in mammals is echolocation. Um, sound actually travels much farther and faster in water than it does in air. And so they use sound in their ears um, to be able to detect objects in the ocean, in the world around them, which is pretty cool. Some of the protective color besides the obvious, such as camouflage, include being transparent. If you're transparent, then you will blend into the transparent water around you and or counter shading. And what counter shading is, is if you're dark on top and light on the bottom, when looking down, like you see in this picture here, uh, you're more or less camouflage with the color of the water, which is dark. And then from looking from above, you are more or less camouflaged from the color of the water because the light is shining above. So you, um, by being counter shaded, are camouflaged in both directions. So in the bottom right here, you see, you can 
see a bunch of you know seaweed that's brightly colored and then there is a fish right there in the middle you kind of have to stare to see him and you can't see fully all his features because he blends in well with his environment and thus is harder for predators to see all right again we mentioned the sailfish is the fastest swimmer in the ocean the adaptations that it has allows it to do that include a very streamlined body so they don't have uh you know it's like a teardrop which is the most streamlined shape that you can have its fins are very thin it can be tucked in and the ones that they do have are for stability mostly and to reduce drag uh, they also have a very forked caudal tail at the end and that actually when it when it um, is used reduces drag as well and a narrow peduncle which is the area right before the tail that allows it to get a lot of power every time it uses its fin for swimming or move, moves its whole body so i mentioned that migrations occur up and down the water column we call this vertical migrations and why would organisms do this well in the daytime they're going to be very visible and predators are going to be around and so to reduce that they will go to lower waters uh, deeper waters in the daytime and then at night they will come up to feed on whatever they need to including phytoplankton zooplankton and things so they are able to avoid predators it does require energy to do this every night but the uh, benefit of it is they don't get eaten right food webs are are generally very short right so to get from phytoplankton to zooplankton to um, larger fish is not a lot because uh, there's the diversity of the habitat is not very great um, you can also change your status in the food web depending on the life cycle of a species so for example this fish feeds on a lot of different things depending on how big it is basically um, as a young small larvae it's going to feed on really microscopic things as it gets larger it's going to feed on bigger things so primary production is variable depending on where you are in the ocean the limitations to that include light which is very constant during the in the tropical areas you're always going to have around 12 hours and then changes in the temperate and polar areas so you can see in this graph to the right in the tropics you have very stable primary production in the temperate regions you have a big boom of primary production in the springtime when you get a lot more light um, and then in the polar regions there are lots of region there's lots of nutrients but there's a short window in which the light is available and so in the spring and summer you get lots of production but almost none in the winter you also have nutrients that are limiting to the production of these uh, phytoplankton uh, much like plants are limited in phosphor phosphorus and nitrogen and so to get more of the nutrients bacteria are the uh, producers who help recycle these nutrients and, and provide them for the necessary growth upwelling we mentioned last um, last week is a way to redistribute nu nutrients from lower waters to upper waters and it's very important for many of the organisms um, to receive these cold oxygen rich nutrient rich waters um, into the upper areas so if you're in an upwelling area you're more likely to to have higher primary production than in a downwelling area all right so here's then another um, kind of food web showing how quickly we can get from our bottom trophic level to our higher trophic level again because the you just eat what's in front of you and there's there's not a lot of um, avoidance from predator predators all right so now we're moving to the deep sea the deep sea is scary and gross um, a lot of the things we see there are very unique and in fact we know more about space 
in a lot of ways than we do about the deep sea. Here's a depiction of an angler flesh fish. Um, it's got lots of teeth. Uh, things are not so symmetrical down there. And so it's a, it's a strange world, but we're going to peer into it. All right, so divisions of the deep sea, we talked about these before, the mesopelagic, bathypelagic, and abyssopelagic, and each of these have their benthic um, counterparts as well. So under our epipelagic, we have mesopelagic, which goes to 1,000 meters, bathypelagic from 1 to 4, and abyssopelagic from 4 to 6. And then if you have a trench, you can get even deeper. Below 6,000 feet would be hadopelagic, but that would generally only occur under the active margins, right? So life in the deep sea. At this point, we are out of the photic zone, so we have a great reduction in productivity. There's not a lot of food, and the food that is available is just what kind of rains from up above. And oxygen is abundant because of mixing, but there is a zone where there is minimal oxygen because all the organisms have essentially used it up right so the middle of the ocean is anoxic because it's thought that all the organisms the diversity in the upper levels um, are continually using it and it doesn't get mixed up enough there but there are some organisms that live in these areas including this red humboldt squid i believe it's called or octopus um, yeah actually i'm not sure on that on the name of that but it's a this is one of the rare organisms that lives in this otherwise desolate area of the ocean all right we'll start with the mesopelagic in the mesopelagic we have a lot of vertical migrators and um, this is also where you have a great temperature chain change uh, which is called the thermocline there's also of course as you continually go down have more and more pressure changes. So when you look at vertical and non-migrating fish species, you can see some very um, stark differences between them. Non-migrators are generally flabby. Uh, they aren't really going anywhere. Um, they don't have to worry as much about being streamlined and robust. Um, both of them have large eyes and large mouth and are generally dark in color. But the vertical migrators are generally going to have, you know, some counter shading, much more well-developed bones. They'll have a swim bladder where they can use that to adjust their buoyancies. And, and the non-migrators don't have those things. They're flabby muscles, weak bones, and don't have a swim bladder. So the non-migrating mesopelagic fish, these are some of the oddest creatures you'll ever see. Like I said before, they're weak. They have weak bones, their flabby, watery muscles are just to keep them buoyant in the areas where they want to be. They're generally small. They generally have long, large mouths and long teeth, and large jaws, um, because they're opportunistic. Whatever they see in front of them, if they can get it, they will generally eat it. Um, they also have large eyes. Some of them have bioluminescence, so bacteria or other organisms that can produce light and they may use these for lures or to just navigate themselves through the ocean. They also be, have adaptations for reduced oxygen, which is a hemoglobin with slightly different adaptations so that they can extract more oxygen. Uh, and they just have some weird things. So you can see this one on the bottom right. This was caught. It had this weird extensible stomach so that this organism could eat things bigger than it was. Um, and then would be able to digest and use that energy over a long period of time because they never really know when their next meal is. So here's some mesopelagic fish and you can kind of, um, just by looking at them, determine if they're migratory and not, uh, or non-migratory. So obviously the one in the middle, migratory fish. Um, the three on the left look pretty migratory to me while the ones on the right that are more eel-like and have these weird appendages um, like the hatchetfish, viperfish, and dragonfish look more like non-migrators to me. And you can see they have little parts where they, uh, those little dots represent where they would be, um, have bioluminescence. So there are other animals of the mesopelagic.
uh, mesopelagic, including zooplankton, um, large crustaceans, cephalopods such as octopi and squid. And in fact, this is where the giant squid are proposed to be. That's giant squid are we know that they are there, and we do have some specimens of them, but they seem very. Um, we don't have a lot of information known about them. We do know that uh, sperm whales often go down to this depth uh, to hunt squid and possibly the giant squid. All right, and getting down into the deep dark of parts of the ocean. Here, there is no light. It's uniformly dark. It's uniformly cold. The salinity is the same. The water chemistry is pretty much the same. And there's a continual flow of detritus of rain from the upper layers. So at this point, everything is at least constant. You don't have to worry about change. And so if you can survive in this environment, uh, you don't. You are adapted um, for to live here pretty much indefinitely. Okay. So organisms generally don't have counter shading. They generally don't have any color at all. Um, they may have bioluminescence, and that may be the only source of light that anything ever sees at this point. The bioluminescent, however, is not necessarily like a, used as a flashlight, like in Finding Nemo, but instead used for courtship or communication and to lure things in so they can eat them. The eyes are generally really small, absent, and not really working. Um, and they are generally pressure resistant um, in in even their biochemistry, including their enzymes. All right, so here's your typical um, deep sea fish. Doesn't have a swim bladder, it's flabby, watery muscles, has a weak skeleton, the mouth is also large. When they move, they don't look like they're moving very efficiently. They don't have to move very efficiently because they generally barely move at all. They just kind of sit and wait for something to come into their view so they can eat them. Here are some of the angler fish, uh, which have this little lure on top of them, which they use with bioluminescent, bioluminescent algae for things to come and swim with them. They generally also have male parasitism. So um, this was talked about in class. The little guy on the bottom right, the orange guy, that is the male. And the male will generally attach and embed itself into the female and remain there for the rest of his life and will be used for his sperm when needed um, when the female lays uh, her eggs. Um, and, and the reason why this has evolved is because there are so few organisms in the sea that when these two meet, if they can just stay together for the rest of their life, then they don't have to worry about trying to find another mate every time that they are ready to reproduce. So other reproductive strategies include hermaphroditism, where both, uh, all individuals have the ability to produce both sperm and eggs. And this allows them, again, if they have a chance encounter with another organism, both of them can exchange sperm, both of them can um, reproduce, and just increases the likelihood of having um, fit progeny. All right, um, when you get to the very bottom of the deep sea, there are even further adaptations to help with this. Uh, again, they, they aren't a lot of predators in this area, but instead they rely on the rain, the detritus which falls from above. Um, and so benthic organisms generally have uh, a greater chance of finding food because it's pretty consistent. But you, you can see some of the interesting um, characteristics that they have here include the tripod fish, which basically uses those its fins, the long pointers off of them, to walk around on the the bottom of the seafloor. But otherwise, they have uh, other similar characteristics to non-migrating fish: small eyes, flabby bodies, just kind of wiggle around looking for what they need. All right, uh, there are other organisms such as pteropods, snails, and worms. Um, some of these we highlighted before, small crustaceans. So this is a, a little snail here. You can see most of their structures are either 
clear or red because again there's no light down there the d the bacteria down there don't decompose as fast as other bacteria um, again just because it's colder there um, aren't a lot of nutrients for them and, and things decompose much slower down there uh, there's also the pressure which adds to that um, adds to those conditions decreasing the rates of biochemical reactions all right um, there are of course uh, things which live in the muck at the bottom of the sea the neofauna um, and or things that will dig and burrow into that muck um, it is hypothesized that living in the deep sea also allows organisms to live longer and become bigger and so you have here on the right this is called a sea louse uh, that's basically the same thing as a pill bug same organism this crustacean um, but under the sea they get much bigger and they live much longer and because it's so cold dark and high pressure it's thought that their metabolisms are really slow and that just allows them to live longer they generally reproduce late in life and have few, few large well-developed eggs so they put a lot of energy into having very um, big offspring that are more likely to survive there is a community however in the deep sea which has a high diversity of life rather than relying on whatever muck floats down at hydrothermal vents they have primary producers so this is not something that we've seen except at the surface and these are chemo autotrophic bacteria which use chemicals and heat from hydrothermal vents to create energy and this provides opportunity for other organisms to feed on them and you have actually a diversity of life which extends from them you also have a reef building um, organisms such as these tube worms which provide substrate for lots of things that live there you can see there's a fish and some crabs um, and uh, there's lots of other organisms there as well okay uh, the tube worm is actually has some of this chemo autotrophic bacteria in their body okay so this is very similar to the coral reefs how they work um, and they have a mutualistic relationship with them all right so we've gone through all the different types when you start from the top to the bottom these are some of the changes that take place so in the epipelagic zone we have photosynthesis occurring we have oxygen and carbon dioxide exchanging with the environment um, and that's where most of the diversity is most of the oxygen by that diversity then gets used up and creates this oxygen minimum zone as you go do deeper the temperature also changes it also gets really cold and now once you get to the lower parts you're relying on this organic snow um, for all the organisms to live on and then once you get to the bottom you're at very um, extreme temperatures extreme pressure and few resources for life to live and there's no light as well all right that's it no nope, it's not lit uh, here are just some of the then differences you see uh, in, the, in the different zones right so we've got epipelagic where there is uh, predators, diversity of life, mesopelagic where they migrate and mesopelagic where they don't migrate and then the deep pelagic where they're just flabby large teeth um, and uh, with bioluminescent lures and then the, the the deep sea where you have larger organisms um, and elongated. All right that is it.